Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, lovely people of the internet, of Spotify, of Apple Podcasts, wherever on earth or in space you are at the moment, it's lovely to see you again. Or if it's the first time you're here, my name is Kelly and welcome to another episode of the Sweet Nothings Podcast. This is your home of relaxed, funny and informative chats about the love of eating. We'll talk about the latest food trends, controversial opinions and all things edible. Today, as ever, I want to do all of those things and I want to especially touch on a particularly controversial subject just all the time, but especially recently as it's come to the fore in public discussion again. I want to talk to you guys about processed food, your thoughts on processed food and kind of what we're feeling about the whole thing at the moment as the media tells us it's wrong and some people tell us it's right. But before we get into that, I would like to thank you again just for the great reception the podcast has had both on YouTube and on streaming platforms. I've been very grateful to have had more than like two listens being, you know, one parent and our neighbour or something. (laughs) So thank you again if you're coming back or if you're new here, welcome. Lovely to have you. But let's get into the meat of what has been happening in May 2021 with regards to the world of food. I think, of course, it only makes sense to start on a subject that will be on everyone's lips this month in more ways than one. Because restrictions in kind of many parts of the world are beginning to ease in terms of what we have and have not been allowed to do with regard to the hospitality sector, thanks to the C-19 that shall not be named, (laughs) restaurants reopening has been a big, big part of a lot of people's lives at the moment. Obviously, I understand various parts of the world and different continents are kind of seeing different stages of this at the moment. Some parts of America and of Canada are reopening, many parts of Europe are reopening, whereas parts of Asia and parts of South America are not seeing the same kind of progress. So I understand there will be areas of the world in which this is not applicable. In terms of that, if you are from areas of the world which are still under tight kind of lockdown restrictions, let me know how the food industry is kind of doing its best to survive in the meantime. It's certainly been a roller coaster here in the UK where I am, but I think we're finally starting to see what we even dare call good news now. So in terms of that, it appears that many kind of UK pubs and restaurants have seen indoor dining resume across the United Kingdom, being Scotland, England, Wales and Northern Ireland. And while obviously it's good news, It's one of these things we just have to hope continues. There have been certain forms of hospitality and restaurants, cafes and bars in particular that are still being heavily, heavily negatively affected by the fact that many workers haven't returned to offices as yet and we're yet to find out if they ever will. And this is, you know, this is something that's going to be interesting from an outsider's perspective but for those of us who you know base many of our our lives or our passions or our livelihoods our entire income from the hospitality industry you know it's going to be very difficult to see how everything is going to change over the next little while but in terms of good news it does seem like most places have kind of had a boost according to an article in the guardian here revenues across the hospitality sector have jumped by 43 percent in the space of seven days, which is, you know, it's always nice to see. And apparently jobs in both retail and in hospitality, in bars, restaurants, pubs, cafes are returning to, you know, they're returning to recruiting, they're returning to getting staff back to work off a of furlough and kind of producing a real living for people in this really, really important section of our economy and of our lives. So that, of course, is the big food news of the month. While I don't have much to comment on it, and I don't think many people would at this point, as for many people, hospitality venues have only been open, you know, whether it's your nearest Starbucks or McDonald's branch, or whether it's an actual small family-run business, many have only been open for three to four weeks at the most. So Hopefully we only have kind of upwards to go from here. But that is, of course, the biggest kind of news in 
this month in food. But in terms of food trends, which of course we always like to discuss here, let's let's dig into two food trends that have been dominating various areas of social media this month. The biggest trend I have seen pop up on TikTok this month and only really in the last kind of week or so. It was looking like this month wasn't going to get too crazy, much like last month, aside from, you know, some of the tragic Easter things we saw. May wasn't kind of jumping out at me too much in terms of food trends, but we've been served two very recently. The main one being Gordon Ramsay's soft scramble and bacon jam toast. Now, any listeners, especially British listeners, I'm sure will be familiar with the, for want of a better word, icon that is Gordon Ramsay. Love him, hate him, or, you know, try to forget about him. Gordon Ramsay, his PR team, whoever is behind it, this man has not really become irrelevant at any point in the last... 15 to 20 years between him and Jamie Oliver. I really don't know who is kind of pumping the marketing behind them, but they're doing a fantastic job because no matter what controversy may poke its head out of a corner, these two just keep swimming. So Gordon Ramsay's soft scrambled eggs and bacon jam toast, you know, it might sound delicious. It might sound a bit bizarre. The main focus, especially on TikTok, has been the bacon jam concept. There's, you know, as I'm sure you can imagine, there is absolutely nothing controversial about scrambled eggs with some chives on top, apart from the fact that some people like their eggs particularly rubbery, while some like them to look like, you know, they could hatch at any moment. The bacon jam has been the real point of controversy. So this recipe is now, you know, a fully fledged one present on the GordonRamsay.com website, which I admittedly did not know existed until now. It even has a it even has a gifts section apparently. I might I might look in there later, just including beef Wellington gifts. Okay, anyway, completely tangential to the <laughs> the discussion at hand. The bacon jam has been the real point of contention in this food trend at the moment. So while bacon jam isn't kind of crazy, you know, the UK got over the influx of the American obsession with crispy bacon and maple syrup a few years ago. Around the same time we were introduced to novelties such as cupcakes and pulled pork, we kind of got over and got our teeth into the concept of sweet with savoury. And this is really sort of just a a ramped up version of that. And to be honest, it also seems like the kind of thing that if someone served it to Gordon Ramsay on MasterChef, or on Hell's Kitchen, or on Kitchen Nightmares, or on The F Word, or on any of the long list of shows I can't remember that Gordon Ramsay is or is not still hosting, (laughs) it seems like the kind of thing that if they'd served it to him, he would have spat it onto a plate let out a stream of expletives and probably thrown something across the room, especially if it was one of the American shows. He gets particularly spicy on those. But to give you a breakdown of why this has been a notable recipe, the bacon jam includes bacon, onions, shallots, nothing untoward so far. Now, this is followed by half a cup of brown sugar, half a cup of maple syrup, half a cup of freshly brewed coffee, and half a cup of apple cider vinegar, and some chilli flakes. Now, you know, I like to think of myself as quite an open-minded gal, so apart from the fact that he's offered most of these initially in cup servings, which causes me mild heart palpitations, (laughs) this, it's a bizarre mix of ingredients. I understand the bacon with the brown sugar or the bacon with the maple syrup, but when we're throwing that much vinegar and an equal quantity of coffee in here, I'm intrigued to say the least. And this recipe, which takes over two hours to make, I might add, to kind of reduce this jam to jam, even caramelizing the onions takes almost half an hour. It's a very involved breakfast, shall we say. But I have been enjoying not only Gordon's portrayal of it on TikTok, because of course his PR team have found and completely monopolized TikTok, as he has with many other social media platforms. And in true Gordon Ramsay style, you know, it's sourdough, slice, butter, flip, and all of the various other kind of very 
simplified instructions he gives for what is actually a very complicated and time-consuming recipe, he shows off how to make this extremely fancy breakfast that ends in a singular slice of buttered white toast with this bacon jam and the soft scrambled eggs. And of course, new queen of food TikTok, Lizzo, who you may be familiar with, or you definitely should be familiar with by now, with her music, her flute skills, her dancing, her clothes, her internet personality, all of them. Lizzo made a veganized version of this on TikTok and just helped it kind of explode into even more mainstream views. And you know, as far as food trends go, as kind of troubled as I initially am by looking at the ingredients list, I'm intrigued to the point that I might even consider trying it. And it's one that even though it is a little bit ridiculous on the surface, it's not wasteful, it's not over the top, it's not excessive like most other food trends tend to be. You know, we might not all be his biggest fan, but you have to give it to this man for staying on top of the internet at all times. <laughs> the next TikTok trend I raised you here, which you may have seen, you may have tried this, because really, I don't know if we can actually call it a trend. I don't know if we can call it a viral recipe. Essentially, it boils down to pesto eggs. Fried eggs with pesto. Pesto with some eggs. You know, you could probably guess the recipe just by me giving you those two ingredients because that's literally all it is. Pesto is, of course, rooted in delicious, nutritious and iconic tradition from Italy. You'll find it used mostly with pasta, in some other recipes, but not kind of messed with too much because if Italy do anything, when they find something that's good, they don't kind of feck around with it too much, you know? They, they do it and they do it right. But pesto, at least in the UK, also has this kind of connection to student life. And it's something I've seen a lot of other students post about and it's something I just think of as like a teenage food or a very young person's food. One of the first dishes many people of my sort of millennial slash Gen Z generation learned to cook by themselves was some pasta. You know, it's pretty hard to mess up a pan of boiled pasta and chucking a jar of pesto on top. Now, it's probably the kind of pesto that would make the traditional Italian recipe creators shudder in horror, but it's fairly nutritious, it's fairly tasty, it's cheap and it's very fast to make. I don't know why it has taken until our holy year of 2021 for people to realise this, could also be added to a pan of fried eggs and called a whole recipe of itself. <laughs> but essentially, whoever it is, whether it's America, whether it's just someone who popped off the recipe of their own accord, has found pesto, chucked it into a pan with a couple of eggs, kind of spread it around the pan, cracked two eggs into it and just let that cook added some olive oil, then either eaten that just as it is with some chili flakes or they've shoved it on a bit of toast or something. The more fancy ones, as any visual viewers will be seeing right now, is being served with some cream cheese and some avocado, a bit over the top if you ask me, but you know what? It's probably delicious. The thing that gets me with this, you know, while I understand the other toast-themed trend of this month with Gordon's bacon jam, is this a recipe? Is this a trend or is it just that someone had a jar of pesto taken up space at the back of the cupboard that had expired a month ago and they needed to eat it with something and they didn't have any pasta? <laughs> I don't really know. And I've seen an article, I think, from the kitchen.com or kitchen.com. I'm not sure exactly how it's supposed to be pronounced audibly. The article basically expressed that one of the issues with this, unless you're using the most superior bloody Waitrose fresh pesto straight from Geneva, <laughs> that people were having issues with the pesto turning this kind of murky, swampy green in amongst the pan of eggs. I think it's a bit inevitable, but it's probably still going to be delicious. I don't know if it's a trend, I don't know if it counts as a recipe, but I'd eat it. I probably have eaten it and haven't thought about it. 
What do you guys think? Pesto eggs? Is this something that we're going to look fondly back on in on the dawn of 2022 when we think back to the food trends of 2021? Or are we just going to keep putting pesto on things the same way that we do with most other condiments? I don't really know. You're listening to the Sweet Nothings podcast. If you want more recipes, food reviews, and knowledge on all things edible, you can find it at maverickbaking.com and at Maverick Baking on YouTube. But that is about all we have for food trends and food news this month. Shall we move on to the meat and potatoes, or rather the spam and smash of this month's episode? I want to talk to you guys today about processed food. A hot topic, just continuously since the dawn of whenever we coined the term obesity, essentially. This kind of popped back up on my radar when I saw this article that's been published in the BBC and various other forums, and it's also becoming a TV show, I believe, on Thursday the 27th of May, if you're interested in watching that kind of thing. The article being titled, What Happened When I Ate Ultra-Processed Food For A Month? Now, this is an article centred around TV presenter and doctor, I believe. I'm not sure which kind of doctor, but he, you know, is involved in various medical TV shows and many around nutrition. His name is Chris Van Tulliken. You may have seen him on British TV. So the article I'm talking about, which is based around this show and this experiment, Dr. Van Tulliken increases his usual intake of 30% ultra-processed foods to 80% of ultra-processed foods for four weeks. He claims it sounds extreme, but it's the diet that one in five people in the UK eats. Now, this is already two things which are beginning to arc me here. The first being, I think if you increased any part of your diet by more than double of what you already consume of it, it's going to be bad no matter what you're doing. If you double the amount of coffee you're drinking, your heart is not going to enjoy itself. Your anxiety levels will be through the roof. You probably won't sleep very well. If you were to more than double your intake of cucumber, you would never be out of the bathroom. It's a it's a diuretic. You would be peeing constantly. It's, you know, unless it was literally water or iceberg lettuce, more than doubling your intake of anything is probably going to have a detrimental effect. Secondly, Claiming this is the diet of one in five people in the UK is probably supposed to be a shocking statistic. But, you know, if you are someone who lives a normal life here in the UK or in any part of the world, for that matter, this is not news to you. This is definitely not shocking to you. Many of us live on processed foods or these supposed ultra-processed foods for entirely valid and entirely good reasons. If you have ever been a little bit strapped for cash or if you've been completely skint, if you have been completely in debt, if you grew up in a single parent household, you know, where your parent wasn't able to work or was only able to work minimally and there were multiple children, multiple mouths to feed, grandparents to look after. Anyone who hasn't really had a kind of glittering middle class or above lifestyle, this will not be news to you. This will just have been a fact of your childhood if you were born anything after the 1960s, essentially. So I don't really know what presenting this information is doing at this point. Now, throughout the article, obviously the show hasn't been fully aired yet, so this will just be the kind of quote-unquote shocking highlights, but he claims that the diet made him feel 10 years older, he gained weight, he he felt anxious, he had heartburn, his libido was lowered, and he also had piles from the constipation. Now, you know, again, If you've ever lived on a diet that is not utterly gleaming with nutritious and fresh foods, none of this will be shocking to you. I just think these things are a little bit unnecessary and patronising sometimes. The part that really got me about this, as is always the case, and especially so... I understand with which on the BBC, because the BBC does have to be impartial. 
you know, it's not supposed to tell us one thing or another. We are supposed to kind of glean our own views from the BBC because it is a public broadcaster. But let me just read to you how the article closes itself out here. And, you know, just throw the first word that comes to mind once I have finished these couple of paragraphs for you. Throw them at me. Foods can be categorised as minimally or unprocessed. For example, tomatoes. Processed, tin tomatoes, and ultra-processed, store-bought tomato pasta sauce. Some ultra-processed foods are healthier than others. Whole grain breakfast cereals, wholemeal sliced bread, tinned baked beans, and unsweetened soy or plant-based drinks are all ultra-processed but have nutritional benefits. Similarly, ready-made pasta sauces, ready meals, spreads, and sliced meats can be healthy. Some pre-prepared foods are not ultra-processed, but any that include additives and chemicals not used in home cooking probably are. The availability, convenience and marketing of ultra-processed food makes it almost impossible to eliminate. Although a diet high in ultra-processed foods is not recommended, eating them on occasion is unlikely to cause a risk to health, according to a dietitian named in the article. Having a healthy diet is all about balance. Now, if you thought of the word confused after reading this, you know, same here, sis, because what on earth was that? (laughs) Basically, it just very patronizingly tells you that some foods are good for you, some foods are not, which in itself I already have a problem with, but it doesn't give you an answer. It doesn't tell you that you should stop eating these things altogether. It doesn't tell you that you should up your intake or lower your intake of these things. And throwing the sentence, having a healthy diet is all about balance on the back of another article full of fear mongering in the everyday eater is just laughable, if you ask me. Let me know if you think that's controversial, if you disagree with that. I just think this is an extremely confused take and I don't really understand the purpose of it. Of course, some foods have slightly higher nutritional value than others, but every single food on the planet has nutritional value. That's why it exists. Even if it is purely carbohydrate for energy, that is still nutritional value. It's not the ideal thing to make up the entirety of your diet with. It still has value. Similarly, if you just ate butter, it still has value. If you just ate raw steak, it still has value. Of course, having a healthy diet is all about balance. So why do we, you know, insist on republishing this kind of article every couple of years and just scare more people into new eating disorders. That's all this feels like. One of the links within this article linked to another BBC article around ultra-processed foods. Now, I don't actually know if this is a properly defined term. I don't know if this is a scientific term. It's certainly one I hadn't heard until a couple of years ago, but essentially they try to define it by saying that it refers to foods that have a long ingredients list, which just seems lazy, to be honest. You know, most meals have a long ingredients list. If you got your granny to write down every ingredient that she put into a shepherd's pie, including the amounts of milk, any seasoning, it would have a long ingredients list. It's cooking. That's what... (laughs) All food has a long ingredients list, unless you... Even if you're eating a slice of toast with butter, there are over five ingredients in that, even though you can't see them all individually. I really don't understand this take. And then it goes on to say that, you know, again, some of them have nutritional benefits. Whole grain cereals that don't have sugar, though they're ultra processed, are apparently beneficial. Tinned baked beans, though they're definitely ultra processed, might be beneficial to health. It's just the most confusing mixed message content that pushes just whatever is the narrative of the kind of demonized food stuff at the time. 20 years ago, no one touched fat with a barge pole. Everything was low fat. You were reducing fat from everything. People were scared of cheese. People were scared of red meat. Then it became exclusively sugar. Then it became all carbohydrates. You know, you can't eat bread. You'll kill yourself, despite the fact that generations upon generations of our ancestors, especially those who weren't of privileged background, existed almost purely on the stuff. It's just the same kind of regurgitated nonsense every single time. 
But it's not obviously just this couple of articles that have incensed me today that I wanted to talk about. I want to kind of cover the concept of processed food in general. Why is it so demonized? And why are we all so comfortable with saying processed food as like a bad thing, as a devilish thing that we shouldn't ever consume? You know, the perfect diet would have none of it. I just think it's crept into our vernacular incredibly quickly and it shouldn't, essentially, is my stance on this. First point being, you know, all food is processed. Every single thing, unless in the morning you wake up at five o'clock, you go out, you milk your own goats, you know, take it back into the kitchen, still hot and full of bacteria, and then you go back out to the garden, pull a few soily carrots out of the ground and just chow down on that for your breakfast. In that case, you can tell me that your diet is completely unprocessed and of course I'm going to have to accept it. But if, like the rest of us, that's not what's happening, pretty much every single thing you eat, if not every single thing you eat, is processed to some extent. And you might think, Kelly, fruit and vegetables aren't processed. Most vegetables are soaked with pesticides before they reach our table. Many of them are chosen for supermarkets that we buy them from by colour, by size, by shape. They're then typically washed before they get to us, wrapped in plastic, and then most of the time we're going to have to process them further by chopping them or cooking them before we can even eat them without it causing an upset stomach. This is what human digestion is. <laughs> And those of, course, those, of course, are the foods that are considered really to be unprocessed. A smoothie is a processed food. A soup is a processed food. Orange juice is a processed food. Sourdough bread, as popular and healthy as it's been made to look by, it's, you know, it's got a PRT mobs as good as Gordon Ramsay at this point. It's a processed food. It's a fermented pile of flour and water, folded with a bit of salt, left to stew for even longer, and then baked. It's a processed food. Even the healthiest diets on the planet that you can think of, you know, the kind of Far East Asian diets, such as the, the kind of peak Japanese diet or the Mediterranean diet, also center around processed foods. Yes, they're heavy in vegetables. They're also heavy in things such as pasta, as noodles, as rice, all heavily ultra-processed foods. Many other foodstuffs in those diets being fermented, another process. The term processed is just such a large and unhelpful, scary umbrella term that I don't think takes us anywhere in terms of knowing what on earth we should or shouldn't be eating. And of course, as we've touched upon, just because something is processed doesn't mean it's unhealthy or doesn't mean that it's healthy either. Just because something is unprocessed doesn't mean it's healthy. Drinking water straight out of the ocean unprocessed wouldn't be particularly healthy. <laughs> And of course, I understand that at this point it may sound like, of course, the baker is sitting here defending processed foods. It is literally in her interest. I completely understand it sounds like that. But instead of sitting here just simply defending the negative takes on processed foods, think of the positives of them. They are the very reason that some people are still alive. As dramatic as it sounds, processed foods are are affordable and they are widely accessible. No matter your budget, if you're able to pick up an affordable processed food, that might be the only meal you get today. It might be the only meal you're able to give your kids today. Furthermore, perhaps you work ungodly hour shifts and you need processed foods, you need little kind of packaged snacks or microwave meals to be able to eat in whatever tough job you are doing that you need to be fueled through. We can't all rely on freshly chopped salads and freshly picked fruit and, you know, grass-fed beef to keep us all alive. The world would be a wonderful place if we could, but it's just not it's just not reality, which is why it seems so patronizing when we're told this message over and over again. Most of us know the lifestyles we lead aren't entirely healthy. We're just trying to get through and kind of enjoy things at the same time without having our entire lives and choices picked apart. And speaking of enjoyment, processed foods are designed to be enjoyable because not every part of life is enjoyable. If I can pick myself up from a crappy day by reaching into a drawer and pulling out a chocolate bar, so be it. You know, would it be better that I did it with cigarettes? Would it be better that I did it with vodka? The endless debate. Are we ever allowed to enjoy anything that isn't healthy for us? And another point I've thought of, you know, having covered this topic before on YouTube, having covered this in articles I've written on Medium before, if you want to go and check those out, another point that kind of 
has come to me during the process of recording this is that processed food is actually the key that has been helping a lot of people in reducing their animal product consumption, for example. The world, many parts of the world are slowly moving towards accepting vegetarianism, accepting pescatarianism, accepting veganism and various other forms of diets that have been formed by the realisation of the consumption of meat's impact on their bodies, on their wallets or on the environment. And without processed foods, many people would find vegan, pescatarian or vegetarian diets an absolute nightmare, impossible. You need products like peanut butter, you need products like tofu, you need meat substitutes often to kind of keep you full of protein, to keep you full of B vitamins, it's simply not feasible to live purely off the land, completely. Much like the argument against genetically modified foods, while we would love to live in a fresh living farm utopia, it's just not feasible. It's not feasible for the vast majority of people on the planet. And so I think while I understand the message they're trying to send about helping people lose weight or helping people feel a bit better, cutting a couple of bags of crisps out of my week is not going to be the elixir of life that the BBC articles tend to make it out to be. And as always, I wanted to get opinions from you guys on what you thought of the kind of processed food issue as well. So you very kindly responded to my social media polls, again, with some great answers. Some funny, some very serious. My favourite one that's come in so far, when I asked what people think of processed foods and whether they eat them, my, fav- my favourite has come from someone who said that if they continue to eat the amount of processed foods that they do, they will start to glow in the dark. <laughs> Well, that isn't the point of what I was trying to get to here. I love the answer and I just couldn't leave it out. And, you know, there were a couple of people who came in to say that they like their food fresh and made from scratch, which I think most of us do if given the choice, if we have the time, if we have the money. But most people did come in and say that without processed food, they wouldn't be able to live the life that they currently do. Someone just said yes. Someone said, yep, I couldn't live without processed food. Someone said um, sometimes they really can't be bothered to make a fresh meal. So a ready meal really ticks the box. And someone made a very good point of saying they're a means to an end and they're often waste reducing plus tasty. The waste reduction thing is actually a very interesting point because you can find that ready meals or meal kits, especially if you live alone or if you only live with one or two other people, that it can be a lot easier or a lot less wasteful in terms of money, ingredients or packaging to get a ready meal rather than, you know, bags and bags of vegetables, especially now when fresh unwrapped fruit and vegetables and ingredients has kind of been rolled back thanks to the pandemic. Other comments I received included someone who just said it depends, which I like. It's a very diplomatic, it's a very lawyer answer. I appreciate that. Someone else has said, my diet is like 40% processed and 60% non-processed. I have no shame in that. We only live once and only have so much time to get shit done. Plus all food is processed if you think about it, which is pretty much exactly mirrors my position on all of this. A couple of other answers. I eat a fair bit of processed foods due to time constraints. They leave me feeling like I've failed morally as well as bankrupting my health. It doesn't really help that my friends make a big deal out of eating healthily, to be honest, as that makes me less likely to make an effort to change and just makes me resent them a bit. In short, I'm an idiot. (laughs) Again, one of my favourite responses. They followed by saying, obviously, eating processed food does not come near the heights of proper cooking and they're less satisfying, which I don't think many people would disagree with. It just depends on the circumstances. Someone else is responding saying, yes, I eat a lot of processed dinners. I think because I can only cook for myself, it's too much hassle to do lots of cooking for myself. And I tend to throw vegan sausages or burgers in the oven. Although it always with fresh veg and homemade carbs, such as potatoes, couscous, rice, etc. I'm also a sucker for processed snacks. Basically, the answers were kind of along the lines of what I'd expected. I did think a few more people would kind of come in with the fear of processed foods that many of us have, including myself, when I was deep in my eating issues and my eating disordered stages of my life. But we didn't have that. And I'm wondering if this is because people, especially in the wake of the chaos of 2020 and 2021, are kind of starting to realise 
that some of the fear-mongering isn't really necessary and that some of these products really are what keep us going when everything else looks a little bit bleak. Obviously, processed foods maybe aren't the ideal thing to build your entire diet around. I don't think many people would disagree, but I think the people who do have to do that are either working so much or don't have the money or the means to do otherwise. They may have disabilities, they may be elderly. I don't think anyone would choose this diet. I think we are forced into it by circumstance and that no one should really be condemned for that. Furthermore, if you enjoy the processed foods, you like eating them and, you know, you're not dying, (laughs) keep doing it. You do you. Enjoy yourself. As one of those comments said, if the last year should teach you anything, it's that life is far too short to guilt yourself and especially to let other people's, apart from perhaps your own, you know, surgeon or GP, to let other people guilt you into what you should or shouldn't be eating. Eating processed food will not kill you. It's said so in these things before, and eating entirely unprocessed foods is not some kind of elixir of life that means you'll never die. I think it's important to remember it, and I think it's important to always stay kind of critical of these demonizations of processed, everyday convenience or working class foods, shall we say. So that's about all I have to kind of cover on this topic today. It's just something that I really, really felt I wanted to dedicate the podcast to this month. Do, as always, let me know your views. Let me know whether you follow Maverick Bacon on social media at all. You can find me on pretty much every single platform. Or if you're a YouTube viewer, do feel to drop it into the comments. I always, always read them. And I'm very, very interested to know your thoughts on this. Thank you so much for everyone who has already responded to my polls and my kind of questions that I've asked. It's always, always appreciated. I hate to sound like some kind of rabid conspiracy theorist, but it's a topic I'm just really passionate about because what we definitely don't need people to be is more scared, more judgmental or more guilty around what they feed themselves, what they feed their children, what they feed their elderly or disabled relatives. I think especially considering what we just come out of in the last year, the last thing we need is to be told how terrible our choices are when they're not realistically even that terrible. But do let me know your thoughts. And thank you, as always, for listening to the Sweet Nothings podcast. I realise this episode might have been a bit spicier than the last two, but do let me know if you'd like to hear about more controversial topics or if you prefer the more kind of low-key, chill conversations that we've had in previous episodes. But I'm afraid that is all I have time for in this episode. Thank you guys, as always, for listening, for watching, for whichever platform you're consuming the Sweet Nothings podcast on. It's a pleasure to whisper these sweet nothings into your ear and I look forward to chatting to you again. See you for the next one. You're listening to the Sweet Nothings podcast. If you want to support the production, get access to exclusive foodie content and early access to podcast episodes, you can do so via Patreon. Just search for Sweet Nothings or Maverick Baking on Patreon and thank you for everything.